Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this workshop, international workshop on um, assessment of combined exposures to multiple chemicals. My name is Heather Wallace, and I'm here to chair this event. My first job is to welcome you to the colloquium and to welcome Julianne Kleiner from EFSA, who will give you an overview of the topic on behalf of EFSA. So thank you very much, and over to you, Julianne. Thank you very much, Esther, and thanks for chairing this important event. Also on behalf of EFSA, I would like to warmly welcome you to this international workshop on risk assessment of combined exposure to multiple chemicals. Due to the epidemiological situation, we decided to have this event in a complete virtual mode but we will make any efforts to make this workshop as interactive as possible. The plenary sessions of these workshops will be live streamed on the EFSA website without any registration and also a welcome to all attending the live stream plenary session. Otherwise, we have over 130 participants and it's truly, and I'm very happy about this, an international mix with participation, of course, from EU national scientific advisory bodies and research bodies, industry, academics, and NGOs, the European Commission Joint Research Center, our sister agency, ECA, as well, quite some representation outside Europe, including US FDA, US EPA, Health Canada, Food Safety Commission of Japan, National Food Safety Authority of Egypt, Jordan Food Drug Administration, and also very happy to have representatives from international organizations, including FAO, WHO, and OECD. So welcome to you all. Just a few words about EFSA. I promise to be very brief. EFSA was created in 2002 in the aftermath of BSE crisis to clearly separate risk assessment from risk management. And EFSA is the reference body for risk assessment of food and feed in the European Union. The work covers the whole food chain from farm to fork. And together with the national bodies and the European Commission, EFSA ensures the food safety of Europe. So, briefly, what EFSA does. Predominantly on request of the European Commission, EFSA provides independent scientific advice and support for risk managers and policy makers on food and feed safety. EFSA's mandate also includes risk communication and cooperation with EU member states and internationally. And without this cooperation, we could not manage the whole workload. So we are very proud of this collaboration and cooperation. What EFSA does not do is just to remind you very briefly. So we are not authorizing any products for the EU market, develop food policies and legislation, nor enforce safety legislation. And here on the next slide, you see the whole area of EFSA's work from plant health over nutrition, food additives, here animal feed, biological hazard, animal health and welfare, GMO plant protection products. And in the middle, you see the scientific committee who is responsible to ensure harmonized cross-cutting methodologies to apply in EFSA's work. And also the current guidance, which we are discussing was de developed under the AGs of the scientific committee. So now to combined exposure to multiple chemicals. I would like to start the journey with the 2014 EFSA colloquium on harmonization of human, animal and ecological risk assessment of combined exposure to multiple chemicals, which was held in Edinburgh. And I have seen many of you were also attending this colloquium in Edinburgh. There we discuss commonalities and differences for hazard assessment, exposure assessment, and the integration of methods and models. It was realized that there are many aspects in common and many research gaps, and, but the biggest problem was the terminology used. We were meaning the same, but talking in different languages depending on the areas. 
The outcome of this colloquium was the basis for the EFSA mixed talks guidance, which was developed by the scientific committee between 2016 and 19. Very briefly to the guidance document here, the so-called mixed uh, guidance document. So we issued, the scientific committee issued the cross-cutting guidance on harmonized methodologies for human health, animal health and ecological risk assessment of combined exposure to multiple chemicals. Guidance is addressed for all sectors dealing with chemical risk assessment and provides an overall harmonized framework for problem formulation, hazard and exposure assessment, risk characterization and uncertainty analysis for whole mixtures and compound-based approaches. So now to the current guidance. For, for human health risk assessment, it was considered that more specific guidance is needed for for scientific criteria for grouping chemicals into the assessment groups. And the, the draft current guidance provides a framework to apply hazard-driven criteria for grouping chemicals into assessment groups, depending on the mechanistic information available for the chemicals, of course, with the gold standard having here adverse outcome pathway information. The guidance also explores prioritization methods to be applied when the number of chemicals is vast to be considered for grouping or within an already formed group and for chemicals which are unlikely to co-occur or would only contribute marginally to a combined risk. They, those chemicals could be considered of low priority, but of course the cutoff values needs to be tested. And then the, the draft guidance also provides recommendation to test the applicability of the proposed criteria. And to this end, really, interagency, member states and international cooperation is needed to facilitate data exchange and harmonization of tools and, and methods. You know, the mixture assessment factor is looming around in Europe and we really have to work together. To get the science right. And with this prologue, I would like to thank you already very much for sharing your expertise and wishing you a very fruitful and open debate. Thanks very much for joining this event. And back to, to Heather now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julianne, for that nice overview of EFSA's approach. So it's now my pleasure to um, just welcome you once again to this um, international workshop. And if I can have the first slide, please. Thank you. So my name is Heather Wallace, and I'm a professor of biochemical pharmacology and toxicology at the University of Aberdeen but I'm also a member of the CONTAM panel here at EFSA, and I'm one of the vice chairs of that panel. And it's my huge pleasure to chair this event this, uh, for the next three days. Um, the event has proved, as, as Julianne said, very popular, and we have over 130 participants. So congratulations on those of you who have uh, managed to secure a place at this event. So, we can so um, the assessment of risk associated with combined exposures to multiple chemicals is, is not a new field but it is a very challenging one both for risk assessors and for risk managers and and this is due to a number of things it's due to the complexity of the problem that we face and the vast number of chemicals that are involved as well as the differences that we see in toxicity profiles and human exposure profiles. So what this workshop aims to do in the next three days is to bring together the diverse scientific communities um, who are interested in the combined exposures to multiple chemicals and to discuss the challenges that are faced by, by these exposures. 
The second aim is to identify the drivers for grouping chemicals for assessment and prioritisation. And thirdly, the aim is to consider what are the future challenges for risk assessment and any ideas that might be helpful in going forward. I'm having a little challenge with my clicker here, sorry. <laughs> right. Um, so, EFSA has already, as you've heard from Julianne, EFSA has already carried out quite a bit of work in this area. And there are two guidance documents, which you can see on the right hand side here, that have already been developed. The first was published in 2019, and it was about harmonisation of methodologies, ensuring problem formulation, exposure and hazard assessment and risk characterisation were clarified. And the second one, which is published in 2021, is still in draft format, but it is about scientific criteria for grouping chemicals, either through hazard-based criteria um, or component-driven versions, or prioritisation. So just to give you a quick overview of the whole event, the programme will last for three days. Um, it will be the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday this week. And it's about information exchange, first and foremost. So there will be several plenary talks um, which will follow, follow this presentation of mine. We really want to encourage you to engage and interact with the workshop. And there will be breakout sessions, which Jean-Louis Dorn will explain to us later in this afternoon. We're also hoping to generate some ideas in the breakout sessions and to have lots and lots of plenary discussion. There are um, question and answer sessions. Um, we will be able to ask questions. And if you look at the Works Up platform, you should be able to find a QA and a um, function in the, in the Works Up platform. So just to explain what's going to happen today, um, we're going to um, start with the idea of harmonisation of methodologies. And there will be five presentations followed by a breakout session. And the topic of the breakout session is hazard driven criteria for grouping chemicals into particular assessment groups, um, understanding systemic toxicity to mechanistic understanding. So what you can see here is um, the hazard driven criteria for grouping chemicals. And this is a hierarchical process where you group chemicals into assessment groups depending on their, their overall effect. Now you can see that the chemicals are first of all defined often by the terms of reference that are provided by the um, mandate. And also the chemicals have to pass what we call a gatekeeper step whereby they, they are included in the for consideration. And what, what we would like to do is to, in fact, define the chemicals that go into the assessment group, but also to exclude chemicals that have low priority, if, if you like, that have low marginal, make a marginal contribution to the, the toxic effect and therefore considered low priority and could be excluded. So what you can see on this slide is, is the kind of gold standard method, which is using the mode of action or the adverse outcome pathway. And that carries with it the least level of uncertainty. So if, if you have a mode of action or an ad, and or an adverse outcome pathway, then you can decide whether to include chemicals in the assessment group and your level of certainty will be relatively high. As you go down from the mode of action and adverse outcome pathway through the toxicological effect, or just simply the adverse outcome, or into the target effects, which might be the organ or the system, you actually have an increasing level of uncertainty in whether or not to include your chemicals in the assessment group. And as you can see, if your chemicals do not cause an adverse outcome or are not targeting an organ, then hopefully they can be excluded from the assessment grouping. As I say, the gold standard is the mode of action, and then we want to move down into common targets or common toxicities. Day two will start with a reporting back um, session. 
and a plenary discussion and Q&A. So what will happen is that each of the breakout sessions have a chair and a rapporteur, and the rapporteur will report back um, at the beginning of day two to encourage discussion and um, questions and answers. There will then be a second breakout session, which will be about exposure-driven and risk-based criteria, and it's about setting priorities and thinking about tools that we might be able to use um, in this manner. And here you can see prioritisation methods. Um, I, I don't mean to take you through all of this because you will see it in several times in the um, breakout group. But what you can see here are, are the metrics, again, for including or not including um, priority chemi chemicals into the assessment grouping. And if you look at the hazard metrics, for example, on the left-hand side, do they have a, a common effect on organs? Do they have, do they have um, combined risks? Can we make that a contribution to predefined thresholds? And, and again, this will be explained. Then that can be either included or not included, depending on the answer, yes or no. Again, this decision tree is, is, is a, a standard methodology. Decision trees are a standard methodology. And you can see that we also have hazard metrics for critical, uh, critical effects. And again, it's yes, no answers. And you either include or not include um, into the priority groups. So all of this is about ensuring that when we actually look at the chemicals for their adverse effects, we are including those which are really important um, and excluding those which have a marginal effect on toxicity. Day three will again be a reporting session, again with our chairs and rapporteurs. And again, we hope to have a really vibrant and positive discussion about the session, breakout session two. Final breakout session will be on day three, and that will be about future challenges to risk assessment um, of combined exposures to multiple chemicals. So this will be a very wide ranging discussion. We're looking for any new ideas, anything, anything that has cropped up in, in discussion sessions. And we're looking also for activities that might support in solving some of the challenges that we face in trying to understand and, and do the full risk assessment of these combined mixtures of chemicals. So I hope that that has given you a, a summary of how the day is going to work, how the, how the international workshop is going to um, pan out. Um, you, will, you will be led through all the discussions. Um, as I say, there is a function on the WhatsApp platform for Q&A. So you will find a Q&A function there. Um, those questions will be fed back through me and hopefully um, we'll be able to get answers to them um, uh, within, within the time of the workshop. So thank you for listening to me setting the scene. I, I hope that's given you an overview of what we're planning to do and how we're going to achieve that. And it's now my pleasure to start our plenary sessions. Um, the first one, is um, to introduce to you Professor Krister Hogstrand. So Krister is a professor in the Department of Nutritional Studies at King's College London. Hi Christopher. Um, and he is also a member of the CONTAM panel and in fact he is my co-vice chair at, um, at CONTAM. So without any further ado I will hand over to Krister who is going to talk about the Mixed Talks guidance document and hopefully answer a few questions. Thank you. Over to you, Krista. Thank you so much, Heather, for that introduction. So let's see if I can get this clicker thing to work. So um, I'm afraid that there will be some repetition with the previous speakers already in my presentation, as it is to present to you the work that we've done previously uh, on guidances for for combined exposure to multiple chemicals. So in addition to being to my work here at King's College London and being co-chair of, co-vice chair of the CONTAM, uh, I was also chair of these two guidance or working group that, that produced these two guidance documents. And yeah, so I'm not going into this in detail again, but this is the original document from 2019 
where we um, where we looked at the harmonized guidance, and again we covered both whole mixture approaches and component based approaches, and talking about interactions, and it includes the the normal steps that you have in risk assessment, but then adapted to uh, mixtures mixtures toxicology. Uh, the areas that we covered are those that our FSA is responsible for. So it's human risk assessment, where we are assessing regulated products, as well as contaminants in food, in feed and food chains, should say. And um, animal risk assessment, where we have pesticides and feed additives and contaminants in feed. And ecological risk assessment, where we again have pesticides, feed additives and contaminants in feed and the food chain. So this was the um, conceptual uh, framework that we have that would then apply to all these different areas um, where we it's, it's a fairly standardized um, risk assessment framework where we start with the problem formulation and then we're going to look at the hazard and, and the exposure. And we finally bring that together into a risk characterization. And at each step, we're looking at factors that is influencing this and we are, are showing with a sequence of, of, of steps that you should take to do this, or EFSA members also should take to do this. And we also have the default, uh, the dose addition, and how to bridge data gaps when we don't have enough data. So uh, the whole guidance is, or the whole procedure is, is based on tiering principles, where we stop where we don't have much data, so we have a data poor scenario, and therefore we have a very low accuracy in the assessment, and we therefore need to be very conservative and protective in the assessment. And as we get more data uh, up to a complex data complex scenario, then we can have a much higher accuracy and therefore be more realistic, and we need, can be less uh, conservative and more realistic in our assessments. Sorry, click a problem. So here we go. So we start with problem formulation. And the first question to ask is really a mixtures risk assessment warranted. And if it is, what is the characteristics of that mi mixture that we're going to assess? Are we going to use a whole mixture or a component based approach? And if we are going to use a component based approach, what are the grouping criteria? And then what do we do with chemicals that don't fall within this group? and what risk metrics should we use to assess the combined exposure or combined risk. So on the uh, exposure assessment, and again, so this is the tiered, um, tiered framework for, for exposure assessment. So we have on the left, we have the, exposure, uh, the occurrence data, which tells you the amount of chemicals in food. And on the right hand side, we have the consumption data, which tells you how much food is consumed by people and we combine them both, and then we get the, um, the exposure estimates. And of course, uh, at a low, very low tier, we start just with default values, which could be those that are permitted to occur in, in food or feed, and the consumption date that would be default uh, portion sizes, uh, and then that leads to a various semi-quantitative point estimates. And we, if you want to, want to really put it up the tiers, you can go down to individual co-occurrence data, of, um, uh, of chemicals down to individual data of consumption as well. And very unlikely scenario to exist that you actually have that data. So on the hazard assessment, we, we are showing a number of different steps that people can, can go through when they carry out the hazard assessment. But overall, we are looking at how toxic is really each chemical uh, in this collection of chemicals that you've been presented with. And uh, we then get the toxicity values for each of these chemicals. Uh, and we are considering if they interact with each other and become more toxic when they are in a mixture than if they won't be. On the risk characterization, then, we have various matrices to, to assess the combined risk. And again, you go through different steps, but in essence, we combine the exposure and toxicity data 
for all chemicals to get risk values. And then uh, we are assessing if there possibly is a concern for the human health or for the environment or for farm animals, if that's what we are assessing. And if the answer to that is that the clicker doesn't work, then I don't know what we do. Um, if the answer is no, then we stop. Which is the easy part, but if the answer is yes, then we have can either refine the assessment, uh, that is, we can uh, access or generate more data, depending on, on what uh, type of risk assessment you're doing, or if we're going to as high in the TS as we possibly can, then the next step is really to discuss with risk managers how we can reduce exposure. After the publication of, of this document, we also had published two technical reports uh, on, on case studies that included human risk assessment and animal risk assessment uh, for combined exposure to multiple chemicals. And in addition to that, been several other documents published now from, from EFSA, in EFSA journal, as well as in other journals. Uh, so we also have this thing that we called uh, interactions, uh, which is part of the cocktail effect. So you go to your, your favorite place in, in, in Italy or wherever you are, and you have a nice limoncello to drink, and you feel quite up for a second one, and you want to try the Barganin Barganolino, which is absolutely fine fine as well. And after that, so oh, I really like to, to try that Nokino. So um, you try that one and it turns out that, that you have a headache the day after or you become a little bit more tipsy than you thought that you would do, potentially because uh, of, of chemicals that cause interaction with the alcohol that you have in your, uh, in your drink. Uh, so interactions can either be synergism, which is when essentially component one, two, and three uh, adds up to more than three. Uh, so you have the mixture has a greater effect than the individual components com uh, individually. Or you can have an antagonism where the individual components together leads to less of an additive um, effect. This is often um, a cause of the toxicokinetics part of the uh, of the toxicity uh, so in the uh, in the metabolism essentially of the of the chemicals so we need to check if interactions occur for for your mixture and at the level of exposure which is important because uh, interactions are not very common and in most cases where they have been been documented it is actually at levels at concentrations or doses that are above those that you normally most people would, would encounter. If that occurs, then we need to integrate that into the risk assessment. We can do that by adding another uncertainty factor, or we can actually gather uh, experimental data for a biological based model, which I will show on the next slide. So in this case, this is a, we can derive a model deviation ratio. This is from a study of, of bees. And you have in the in the purple line or curve, you have the toxicity curve for the combination. And on the right hand side there, you have the two uh, components, chemical A and chemical B, uh, and the toxic units for those. So uh, you would predict from if there was an additive response, you would predict the curve that is is in green, which is the the uh, the additive response. But if you then, as in this case, you observe a much higher toxicity uh, of this combination of two chemicals when they are together, then you need to do something about it. And you can derive this, this um, model deviation ratio, which you then add as a safety factor, essentially, to the, to the uh, assessment. So to mix tox two, which is then to help uh, people to, or scientists, to group chemicals into assessment groups. And this is specifically for human risk assessment in this case. So it started in May 2019, where it was clear that there was a need for more detailed information and detailed guidance on how to group chemicals. 
and it was a key element for setting cumulative risk assessment groups for human risk assessment of pesticides as requested by DG Sante and the Commission and also of relevance for contam for grouping contaminants such as PFAs and brominated flame retardants among others and relevance for, for uh, feed up in, in, in risk assessment of mixtures of essential oils and botanicals and also relevance of to guidance documents for FAF panel for food smoke for smoke flavorings and grouping includes also chemical properties structure class functional groups etc and use of ECA read across guidance document also for OECD QSAR uh, toolbox to assist this And it gives overall support for all panels essentially in dealing with chemical risk assessment. So this is a document which you have seen twice already. And as you've seen, it, it provides you with the scientific principles and relevant cross-cutting guidance uh, and the context of risk assessment. And it, it's done again by tiering and fit for purpose scenarios, considering all possible uh, data that you have available and it also includes these prioritization approaches which can be risk or exposure driven and uh, it is targeted towards all relevant EFSA areas and also of its international activities and we have been careful to try to harmonize and avoid duplicate uh, other documents and it's been published published for public consultation and um, that's the document that you see to the left of the draft guidance document which was out for public consultation and now is, is returned from that so as as heather was saying the gold standard in grouping is really if you have two chemicals that act exactly the same way so the whole the whole pathway from the external dose someone being exposed taking up the chemical chemical getting to the organ and then you have your first interaction with molecules in the cells, various events that then finally lead to your adverse outcome is called the mode of action. And the part of that that just uh, defines the, the toxic dynamics is the adverse outcome pathway. Uh, and the part that, that determines what happens between the internal dose until you get that initial um, interaction with the biomolecule is called toxicokinetics. So if you have, for example, uh, a chemical that act, acts exactly the same way as a, as a hormone does, then it's fairly simple in that you would have the same initiating event, same receptor leading to the same adverse outcome. That is far from always the case though, which is uh, why we devised this, uh, this um, decision tree as you, you've seen earlier now where we start with the chemicals under consideration and then they have passed the gatekeeper step which is the gatekeeper step is do we really need to do a combined risk assessment and we start and it's also dependent on what the terms of reference is so if we do have a common mode of action a, or a common adverse outcome pathway it's fairly straightforward that we include it into um, the same assessment group and if we don't, then we can go, as you saw before, to a common toxicological effect or a common adverse outcome. Or we can go down to a common target, for example, a thyroid gland. And if that's common, we can consider to include them into the assessment group. Sometimes by doing that, and particularly if you go all the way down to common target organ system, you may end up with a very, very large number of chemicals that are difficult to assess <coughs> Excuse me, in one go. And you therefore need to make some type of um, prioritization. And that's why we were devising, another clicker doesn't want to work with me again. That's why we were devising this uh, prioritization scheme. So we would start there up to the left with the assessment group that we uh, ended up with from the previous figure. And we can, uh, or we may actually consider doing this without having grouped at all before, just to limit the number of chemicals that we are trying to group in the first in the first place. 
And the first question that we ask, uh, do we have hazard metrics for common effects or a common organ system? And if that is the case, we can then uh, look at the combined risk metrics and we can, uh, we can see what each individual chemical, how big its contribution is to the combined risk. And if it is lower than a certain threshold, uh, which will depend on what kind of chemicals it is, then we can uh, exclude it from, or at least a low priority uh, chemical that we don't need to deal with immediately. But if it's above that threshold, then we need to assess it uh, either by a by a running the hazard driven criteria again at the lower at the higher tier, uh, or end up uh, in in the final assessment group that we need to deal with. If we don't have that, then we can also look at the the hazard metrics for the critical effect of each individual component, which may be different, all kinds of different effects, but it's the lowest toxicity value for that chemical. And again, we do the same thing. What would what would sorry, what would the contribution be to the combined toxicity? If it is lower than a set threshold, then uh, we can exclude it from our immediate uh, assessment. But if it is uh, doesn't pass that step, then we do need to assess it in the assessment group. And finally, we can look at the assessment exposure driven approaches and look at the probability that we will have co-exposure from different chem from the different chemicals. And if it's the chemicals are highly unlikely to occur, or a, rather a person is highly unlikely to be co-exposed to these chemicals within the time frame uh, of them being in your body, then we can I call that a low priority chemical that we can exclude from the group. So conclusions of future perspectives. So Mixtox has provided harmonized guidance for risk assessment of multiple chemicals. We have provided frameworks for each risk assessment steps and reporting tables to summarize results from risk assessment. Uh, we also provided scientific criteria for grouping and that's the public consultation graph gu guidance that you've seen and uh, we have experience of this now with pesticide residues and it should work towards faster implementation and cooperation with member state organizations in this area. And also the future work in this area will include um, implementing new approach uh, methodologies, so NAMS for risk assessment of multiple chemicals, uh, more details of how to deal with interactions, uh, devising physiologically based models and other biologically based models to deal with chemical mixtures and also uh, environmental risk assessment to look at multiple stresses for B and that is in the must be opinion that was uh, published in May 2021. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Krista. That was a very clear presentation on the Mixed Talks doc guidance documents. So um, we do have time for a few questions. Um, so perhaps I, I could just start really because what, what's happening at the moment is many of the opinions we're getting through for CONTAM have not just a few chemicals uh, in the mixture, but hundreds of different uh, congeners. And, and I, I kind of was wondering, you know, is, is there a limit to the size of the grouping or, you know, how, how far can we take this with these groups of chemicals where there's hundreds of, or you know, tens of chemicals uh, or hundreds of chemicals? What's, what's the kind of limit? And you know, just what, what are the thoughts on that, please? Well, that is really the question, isn't it? Uh, and uh, well, which is completely dependent on your uh, on your resources. If you have all the people in the world, all the computing power in the world, all the time in the world, then yes, then maybe you can do a very, very large number of chemicals. But I would I would dare that to say that it probably would be difficult to do the chemical universe even in that in that scenario. So often what we are want, what we do want to do is to look for so it will also depend different on different application domains. So for quantum, for example, uh, our terms of reference is, is usually to uh, is, is usually to look at the group of chemicals uh, or a either well, well if you are talking about chemical mixtures, to look at the chemical family. So in that case, 
we would include the chemicals that are within that family. And that, of course, can be hundreds uh, in case yeah. of the phosphorus and brominate flame retardants or, or uh, dioxin like PCBs or, or yeah. So, um, but for others, it's, it's much, much less. Uh, if you are living in the pesticide world, then the, you are supposed now to actually consider exposure to all, all other possible exposures that you might have, which then makes these prioritization schemes absolutely essential because for most mm -hmm. regulatory agencies and certainly for EFSA, there wouldn't be the resources to carry out that task uh, against the chemical universe. Okay, so there's another question here, Krister. Um, there's a big jump between grouping based on AOP and mode of action and grouping based on common adverse effect. Is there a halfway house possible? If a group of chemicals is structurally related and they have the same adverse outcome, can a common AOP mode of action be assumed even if it hasn't been defined? Getting me difficult questions here. Uh, well, of course, you can have a halfway uh, house. You can, you don't, when, when you are going through that that uh, scheme that I was showing with the uh, decision tree, uh, some of the chemicals in there will prob you will probably know much more about than other chemicals. And it's very likely that some of them you know very little about. And, um, and for those that you know more about, then it's easier to put them in the group. And then you need to make that call if, uh, for, for the other ones, and it will be a weight of evidence approach, what the data says that you have. Uh, you may have to add uh, in silico approaches to, to bridge data gaps. Um, and, uh, but even, so the question was also part of the question, is it, is it okay to mix something that you know exactly where it is with something that add, acts via the same target organ, perhaps the same adverse outcome? The, on the same adverse outcome available uh, available information uh, or experimental empirical data suggests that it's um, in most cases, even if you have, even if you don't know the uh, adverse outcome pathway, at least if it has the same adverse outcome, you're, it, the chemicals are likely to have additive effect. Only, or if they deviate from that additive effect, the deviation is, is probably not very large. So, so. so yeah. So an another question is, have, have the mixture effect been assessed on sensitizers? Ah, oh, so um, you can, of course, do that. Um, I don't. I don't actually know if EFSA has done that. Maybe someone else can answer that question. Uh, but of course, you can. Well, of course, you can do that, um, and that could be a um, that could be an interaction if you have a sensitizer, because uh, you could have a potentiation of the effect, which would be one that, you, that would uh, entail an interaction. Mm. And the third question, Krista, you're, you're doing well here. Um, how, how do you handle congeners known to occur in the diet, for example, from other sources than the mixture under assessment? Congeners are the same chemical family that are present in the diet that are, sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. They're not in the same family. Well, I, 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 th I think it's it's probably um, how, how things that are it's probably not congeners, actually. I think it's probably other mixtures. Um, so the, the question was, how do you handle these congeners known to occur in the diet from, from other sources? So... Um, not I, I think it depends, well first first of all it depends on on the framework that you're in but but uh, if you have different sources of chemicals I think that in terms of risk that's irrelevant uh, if they're occurring mm. the chemicals could be from one source it could be from a thousand sources if they are there you are consuming them and therefore you're exposed and therefore they are relevant uh, we know that there are, of course, if we take one example, we know that we have for, for the aryl hydrocarbon receptors, we have, you know, we have synthetic chemicals or xenobiotics that activate it. They have vastly different effect from, or even opposite effect 
from uh, natural ligands of the H receptor, which we have in the diet. Uh, we wouldn't consider, I hope, to, uh, to include the natural ligands for AHR receptor occurring in the diet uh, as, uh, as a combined exposure with those that are xenobiotics. Because in that, it's not only the binding to the receptor, but it's also things like, like the ability to metabolize them and, and the, the constant activation of the receptors. It's not only a single thing involved in it. It's, uh, uh, it, it's not only the binding to the receptor that's involved in it. It's the whole adverse outcome mm -hmm. pathway action or indeed the whole um, uh, mode of action. Yeah. I hope that so, I so the, yeah. Next question is, if a group of chemicals has more than one mode of action, how do we handle this? Well, it depends on their potencies in the potentially, they, potentially there's no limit to the number of assessment groups that, you, that a chemical can occur in. Uh, but in practice, there probably is. Uh, the, what, what you don't do is that if you, if you are having a chemical, well, I think in most, in, most in most cases, a chemical would have the highest effect on, uh, on one target. And that would be the target that would be most relevant uh, for that chemical. But it's, you can't exclude that it cannot be in a, in a second assessment group as well with, with a, uh, a different assessment group with a different target. So um, next, next question, they're coming in thick and fast here. Um, if a substance will only be included in a, in a CAG based based on common effect, i.e. no mechanistic information, could an assessment of confidence in the grouping of the substance be incorporated into the modelling? And there's a for example here. If there was 50% confidence, possibly only using individual residue data 50% of the time with a probabilistic model run. Well, you could do that. I think, I think the outcome of that would probably depend on the uh, or how you deal with that would depend on the outcome of the risk assessment. If you, by having a low confidence in, in your in your grouping, end up still not having a problem, in in other words, that your your exposure will not be of concern, uh, or the risk there will be no risk, then uh, it doesn't. You you'll find the way you are. But if if it turns out that you do have a problem that, that is that there is a risk then you would probably need to go up to higher tiers to a higher confidence to deal with that and if it were a pesticide then uh, or regulated product then you can ask for more data to to uh, satisfy that uh, if it is an environmental contaminant then that's a different issue you may already have the best data at hand okay thank you very much Krista. i think i think you've, you've handled that extremely well so um, I think we will now move on to our next presentation. Our next presenter is Dr. Paul Price, who is ex-EPA in the USA. He was an exposure and risk assessor, um, and he uh, on the advisory um, on the advisory committee, and um, so, sorry, on uh, having worked both in the EPA and in industry. So Paul has uh, a mix of experience. And the floor is yours, Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Very good. All right. So I will be speaking on what is happening at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency um, in the area of combined exposures to multiple chemicals. Um, I'm going to talk, uh, first off, uh, let me get the disclaimer out of the way. Um, as, um, as I was introduced, um, I am no longer a full-time employee at the U.S. EPA. I'm still involved with some EPA research projects, but I'm presenting this work as an independent researcher. This work has not been reviewed by EPA and is in no way endorsed by the agency. It is based, however, on publicly available information uh, and my analyses of that, of that information. 
So I'm going to talk in, on, on four areas. First, I'm going to review EPA's legislative responsibilities and inside of those responsibilities, try to find some um, examples of how assessing combined uh, risk from combined exposures to multiple chemicals occurs. Then I'm going to talk briefly about the uh, issues that we uh, are, are, are discussing at this conference and then um, talk about some EPA activities that have recently occurred at the agency and then finally finish up with some new directions at the agency. Now, unlike, uh, this is my impression, most uh, regulatory agencies in Europe, um, EPA has to answer to the American Congress um, for the administration of more than a dozen uh, separate uh, pieces of uh, legislation. And these fall in the areas of hazardous waste, pesticides, water, air, commercial project, uh, products that are not otherwise regulated by FDA, and environmental permitting programs. In all of these areas, EPA has to wrestle with the issue of exposure to mixtures and evaluating the risks from combined chemical exposures. The science policy issues uh, for uh, combined exposures, the answer to this is, is a very good one, which is that the e US and the EU essentially use very similar approaches for assessing combined exposures to multiple chemicals. We use uh, a combination of both whole mixture and component approaches. We uh, use tiered approaches to the exposure and the toxicity analyses that enable us to go from screening uh, conservative uh, approaches that are suitable for in instances where there's limited data, but allows us to uh, 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 dive deeper when the data allow it and when it's necessary in order to answer the question about safety. I'm going to talk uh, uh, about two points. First, the uh, issue of when do you do a component-based approach and when do we do whole mixtures? And the second is to talk about the uh, subject uh, of this workshop, the defining of cumulative assessment groups. Component uh, ap approaches are favored over whole mixture approaches where possible in almost every one of the program offices. The challenge of assessing whether or not uh, a mixture is, is similar or, or, or different from uh, a mixture that you already have data on, um, and whether or not does that trigger the need for additional testing, a recognition that mixtures that individuals are exposed to vary temporally and spatially. Um, all these things favor trying to find some way of dealing with a component-based uh, approach for evaluating uh, of the risks from combined exposures. In addition, uh, we have the, the optimism that sometime in the not too distant future, we'll have an increased number of, of chemical specific standards that will enable us to, to do high throughput um, uh, component-based approaches for more mixtures. Where we can apply uh, uh, component-based approaches, we look to apply techniques that are based around markers. And markers are metrics of the mixtures that can help us identify instances uh, where we're dealing with low risk. And we do this in microbial risk assessment where we identify certain species of bacteria, which are markers for fecal contamination. Where they don't occur, we don't have to worry about searching for the other uh, actual um, uh, disease organisms uh, that would be of concern. In other instances, we find that after we've examined a, a, a source of risk that uh, is a function of multiple chemicals, that we can find that we can identify either the chemicals that drive the risk or the chemicals that are correlated with um, elevated risk. And this we've done in the area of disinfection byproducts where we've identified uh, metrics related to the concentrations of the haloacetic acids and halomethanes, which enable us to predict when, uh, uh, when our water systems uh, disinfection byproducts are concerned. We do the same thing with radionuclides where we look a total amount of radiation rather than the rather than the individual radionuclides. Okay, the places where we do favor uh, combined uh, or uh, uh, actual whole mixtures approach are in instances where aspects of the mixture aren't strictly a function of chemical comp uh, composition, and this happens with uh, 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 air mixtures 
particularly diesel exhausts and wildfire exposures, where the size and the surface characteristics of the particles in the smoke influence the toxicity of the chemicals. In this area, we're, we are more leaning towards uh, identifying systems of, uh, of mixtures that can be used to evaluate uh, individual uh, sources. Now, cumulative assessment groups. As I think everyone here is aware, because EPA administers so many different programs, we don't have a consistent approach for the cumulative assessment groups. The Office of Pesticide Programs has defined assessment groups rather narrowly. Um, and in contrast, the Office of Land and Emergency Management, uh, who administers our hazardous waste programs, actually advocates uh, a very wide or broad uh, cumulative assessment group, essentially starting with every chemical present at a hazardous waste site is first put into a hazard index analysis. And then if necessary, um, the hazard index is refined in a higher tier where uh, cumulative assessment groups are established based upon effects that, that affect a common organ or common system. In the last five years, this is beginning to change as EPA's uh, uh, Office of Research and Development has sought to break the concepts of the of both the aggregate exposure pathways and the adverse outcome pathways to address this question. EPA believes that uh, AOPs provide a better basis for defining uh, the cumulative assessment groups than, than strictly looking at the nature of the apical effects. Observation of two chemicals causing the same effect do not tell you automatically uh, whether or not it will follow dose additivity or response additivity or if they will interact. Um, but information on the uh, two chemicals' ability to affect a common molecular initiating event or common key event in an AOP network leading to a common apical impact can provide such information. In addition, if you're interested in interactions, AOP networks are not sufficient to address kinetic interactions between chemicals because they don't deal with kinetics. They deal with the uh, active moiety initiating a molecular event and then that moving on to the AOP. If you want to address the kinetic interactions, you actually need to combine uh, what we uh, uh, call and what has been called in the literature as an aggregate exposure pathway that looks at the movement of key events uh, in a causative pathway that starts at the source of a, of a, of a chemical and goes all the way to the concentration of the active moiety um, uh, at the site of the molecular initiating event. So recent activity at EPA on combined exposures. And for this, I'm uh, citing uh, the two publicly available off, uh, uh, strategic plans, one for EPA as a whole, and the second one for the Office of Research and Development. And these applied for the years 2018 to 2022. I'm also going to uh, later talk about the initial draft of the uh, 22 to 26 strategic plan and talk about where EPA may be going. Well, the, uh, the answer from looking at the two strategic plans is that EPA didn't do that much in 2018. In fact, the strategic action plans do not include the terms mixtures, cumulative, or aggregate um, in, in either document, either for EPA as a whole or, or the Office of Research and Development. Um, the, the, the focus has been uh, in, in those documents is to focus on the core mission of addressing the uh, requirements of legislation and to respond to the needs of the states. Well, the second issue did wind up bringing mixtures into the um, uh, 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 into the level of, into the concerns of the agency, and that was through PFAS, which was identified as an issue of concern by the states. And as a result, uh, a number of programs were initiated in recent years to look at the toxicity and exposure to PFAS. Now, the Office of Research and Development in, inside of EPA um, was also affected by the fact that uh, of these guidance documents. Uh, these strategic documents. As a result, our work on developing mixture guidance slowed down and we produced uh, very few documents uh, in this area during this period of time. Fewer research projects on exposure and hazard from combined exposures were, were initiated. This does not, however, mean that work uh, related to combined exposures uh, did not occur at the agency. Significant was, work was performed on the basic science that supports the assessment of both separate chemical exposures and combined exposures. This includes on the toxicity side, the development and refinement of, of AOPs for more compounds and for uh, 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 more uh, adverse outcomes. 
and uh, the development of the concepts of AOP networks and AEP AOP networks that are directly relevant to the issue of defining uh, chemical interactions. We've also developed uh, tech, uh, uh, high, high throughput toxicokinetic modeling, and we've developed an inter infrastructure on exposure related information. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, these last two. The high throughput toxicokinetic model was originally developed in order to uh, provide the in vitro and vivo extrapolation that's required to allow the new approach methodologies uh, to be uh, used to establish uh, 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 the safety of, of of external doses, that the, the NAMs uh, uh, typically started with an internal concentration, at least the in vitro ones did, uh, and you needed a way to get uh, to uh, the in vivo uh, um, concentrations that corresponded to those in vitro concentrations. But it does a lot more than that. Uh, the HTTK program um, integrates doses that occur by multiple routes. It determines measures of internal doses for time varying external doses that can answer questions as to whether or not we will ever exceed a concentration that will trigger a molecular, molecular initiating event. It also um, has the ability to address inter-individual variation in ADME from differences in metabolisms and physiology. The current version can model concurrent metabolism of multiple chemicals in one individual. However, it does not model kinetic interactions, but you can uh, model uh, what are the final concentrations, assuming no interactions, for, chem for multiple chemicals in, uh, uh, in, an in an individual. To run this model, you need chemical-specific inputs, and, they, and these are specifically are the plasma binding of a compound and the liver clearance for it. And we have that data available for almost 1,000 chemicals. In addition, QSARs have been developed that have been uh, enable us to, to, to come up with educated guesses uh, for, for these two values that allow us to do things like binning is it's a, of chemicals. This is a rapid or a slow metabolizing uh, chemical. The model and code are publicly available, and there's been extensive QA, QC of the data and model capabilities, and these have also been published. Some of the other relevant research we've done is the use of, of NTA or non-targeted assessment analytical techniques, uh, which identify all of the peaks that are in a mixture so we have, get a better feel as to, as to what actual um, uh, are the combinations of chemicals that um, uh, are reaching somebody from a particular source. Um, and that work is still ongoing. We're getting better at identifying what the chemicals are. We still have a ways to go to identify uh, um, what their actual concentrations are. We are doing systematic work to analyze existing data on monitoring and composition of consumer products. This work involves collecting data from diverse sources, organizing it, annotating it, and curating it, um, and coming up with databases for which we have high levels of confidence. We're developing these databases for concentrations measured in environmental media, compositions of consumer products, and measurements of occupational exposures. We are making this data uh, uh, publicly available with uh, good document, documentation, and the existence of, of trustworthy databases are enable us to do risk assessments and exposure assessments we could not have done before. An example of one of those is we're able to do estimates of what are the common combinations of chemical that frequently co-occur in the general population. We've done that by examining the NHANES biomonitoring data and by looking at um, uh, patterns of use of consumer products. We have systems of categories that we have developed. What, what are, what are the, the types of consumer products that are sufficiently similar that they can be evaluated uh, as a group? Um, what are the chemicals that are used in a common uh, method, in uh, common function inside of a consumer product? We've also developed uh, models of inter individual variation and personal and residential characteristics that are relevant to exposure so we can uh, uh, generate uh, uh, meaningful de descriptions of inter-individual variation that reflects these uh, variations of the, these individual components. We've modeled, we've used agent-based modeling to model longitudinal human activity patterns, and we have actual models of uh, uh, aggregate and cumulative exposure. I'm going to show you um, four quick uh, uh, outputs for, uh, aggregate, uh, uh, for an aggregate model that we're done on the four commonly used parabens whose exposure occurs through, uh, uh, largely through, um, I'm sorry, through diet and through uh, consumer products. And what the line is, is the uh, prediction of the model. What the dots are, are predictions of 
the fr- percentages of the population that have different concentration of doses. And as you can see, for the four uh, parabens, we're within about a factor of three to five of, uh, of not only what is the typical exposure, but what is the high-end exposure and what are the exposures in between. So that's what EPA has been doing. We have been collecting information. We have been building the infrastructures that will enable us in the future to more rapidly uh, and with greater confidence be able to make predictions of uh, of the cumulative uh, and uh, of the uh, combined exposures to individual uh, chemicals and to combined exposures. Now I'm going to talk about uh, in my last four minutes as to where is EPA going. And I'm going to cite a strategic uh, action plan that uh, uh, will be for the years uh, 2022 through 2027 that has just been released by the agency. And then I'm going to to talk about uh, three other points as well. So this strategic action plan um, uh, in four places refers to cumulative impacts and cumulative risks. And it really is coming from the issue of, are there communities in uh, towns and cities of the United States where individuals are being disproportionately affected by land use that has been permitted by EPA? And um, are those land uses resulting in releases or other types of stressors that are disproportionately affecting those communities. This is uh, the charge to answer this question is going to uh, move us back towards uh, of trying to find ways to effectively monitor uh, combined exposures from all sources, food, water, diet, in the environment, use of consumer products, transportation, and to identify those chemical exposures on a community basis, and then also look at the other sources of stress, social, physical, um, psychological stresses um, that come from having uh, the permitted land uses in, uh, in the communities. And identify mechanisms that can combine both the cumulative stress from the chemicals and the cumulative, cumulative stress from the non-chemical stressors to identify what is the overall stress of, on a given community, and then determine if that overall stress varies across communities uh, who are minority, uh, majority, or, uh, or low, who are, are low income. We do have a new version of a guidance document uh, for cumulative risk uh, that is coming out. It has been worked on actively for the last year. It's a follow-up to a report that was done in 2003, and it is expected that it will capture the new research that's been done by the Office of Research and Development and the new goals uh, for community-based cumulative risk assessments. PFAS mixtures continues to be an active area of research um, uh, uh, supported by the Office of Research and Development, particularly looking at NAMS um, as, uh, as techniques for dealing with uh, the vast number of potential PFAS compounds that are in commerce and are in the environment. And finally, um, work continues on the, uh, uh, the NAMs. And uh, in the future, more of that work will be in the form of work on mixtures. And the reason for this is that the techniques to, uh, to, uh, uh, to the process of developing NAMs has started with uh, investigating individual chemicals and uh, only after that was completed uh, did they move on to mixtures. The chemicals are now done, now they're moving on to mixtures. So in summary, the various programs in the, in the US EPA, while diverse, use methodologies to assess risk for mixtures that are similar to those of the European Union. For the last four years, has focused, EPA has focused on building the infrastructure for advancing our understanding and our ability to predict toxicity and exposure that will support NAM-based approaches for assessing risks from combined exposures to multiple chemicals. The new direction for mixtures that can be expected at EPA is the goal of social justice to investigate whether or not disadvantaged communities um, are being uh, asked to shoulder burdens from uh, local sources of risk that are greater than those of other communities. Um, This will require Uh, the integration of physical and social stressors with the assessment of risk from combined chemical exposures, and will, of course, uh, call for an an increased ability 
uh, for us to identify combined chemical exposures on a community basis. The references for the materials presented are here. Questions? Thank you very much, Paul. That was really a clear presentation and beautifully kept to time. Thank you so much. Can I just ask a very quick first question? Um, your yes. HTTP model, is, is that an available model or is that an in-house thing? Oh, no, 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 no. It's, um, it's been used uh, by a number of people outside of the United States. It is on CRAN, which uh, if you're familiar oh. with this, is the is the d database for uh, uh, for for R uh, for programs written in R, um, and we very much want to see HTTK uh, to be used uh, by as many individuals as possible. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so there are a number of questions here. Um, I'll just read them out uh, as we're going along. So the first one is: Could you provide an example? where the US EPA has, a, has applied the component-based approach for prospective risk assessment, and how complex were those mixtures? Hmm. The vast majority of component-based uh, cumulative risk assessments are, are done by the uh, Office of Solid Waste, um, where we go to, um, Superfund sites, and I believe these techniques have also spilled over to our community-based programs. We go to any community and we determine what are the chemical stressors that are present in the community. We then uh, uh, determine what are, is the intensity of the exposure, i.e. The, the, the dose to each one of the chemicals that are received, and then use a hazard index uh, tiered approach to, to evaluate them. Um, how complicated can, can this be? Um, hazardous waste sites can easily have dozens. Um, I think numbers as high as 20 or 30 are not uncommon. Um, it is generally the experience from hazardous waste sites that even when you have uh, 20 or 30 chemicals that are identified as occurring in the site, you will find that uh, it's only a handful, uh, one, two, three, five uh, chemicals that actually are the drivers of the risk and actually wind up uh, directing uh, the cleanup activities at a site. Thank you. Um, that actually leads quite nicely on to the next question, which is, do you take into account the ratio of different chemicals in a mixture or only the absolute amount? I'm not quite sure that I, I, I know the answer to that. The, the process, as I described it, is that we identify the doses for each one of the chemicals that are present at a site. We then take the, we do the hazard index, which is to take the, uh, uh, the, the doses and divide them by the permitted dose, uh, the reference dose, the ADI, the DNL, um, come up with that ratio and sum that and, and, and determine whether or not does it exceed one. Um, and that, process, we are summing the masses, but the masses have been weighted by the measure of toxicity for the chemical. Thank you. The, the next question is, what does the US EPA propose to refine component-based risk assessment if the toxicological threshold value is exceeded? <laughs> oh, the toxicological threshold value is something that uh, the agency has, has looked at and thought about for years, but, but it really is woven deeply into the, the, the regulations at FDA. So it's not something that we use that often, um, and it's not something that we have invested um, uh, greatly in, but we, we have thought about it. Um, the hazard index approach that... Uh, whether it's a margin of exposure that's done in pesticides um, or it's the hazard index that are done in hazardous waste sites. Um, it, those, those approaches uh, have not used the TTC uh, and have not asked the question you know, and, and have not, uh, haven't used the TTC as a screen to say, if it's below the TTC, I don't have to include it in, in, in a cumulative risk assessment. So um, the next one is starts off with awesome talk, Paul. So <laughs> somebody you. really appreciated it. 
the next the question though is are there any plans for experimental work on mixtures with NAMs? And yes. And if yes, I, I, yes okay. Would, would, um, would but, these uh, but, mixture experiments be devised to capture realistic mixtures or for mixtures of hypothesis testing? I believe both. But I right. but it's you know but it'll have to stay in the realm of belief. I'm I'm an I am by training uh, an engineer and chemist. Um, I have only had to live with toxicologists for 40 years, and I can't say that I fully understand everything uh, that is being planned for the NAMs. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is, um, how do you see a role for epidemiologists in the mixtures risk assessment? Okay, I have to take my EPA hat off, which I which it shouldn't have been on anyway, because I'm, I'm no longer a full time EPA employee. Um, I have always thought that uh, the responsibility for regulatory agencies ought to be a um, a, a, a multi tiered strategy that we ought to encourage through the PMN program or other um, uh, uh, pre-manufacture programs, we should try uh, and other sustainable uh, chemistry programs, should try to keep uh, dangerous or risky chemicals off the market. Um, we should have a program that systematically goes and looks for risky chemicals that are already on the market. And then we ought to have some type of surveillance program that says the things that we didn't know were hazardous and are causing a hazard we detect and epidemiology, I would see falling into that third category. And I'm, I'm very pleased to see that uh, we have a greater and greater embracing uh, uh, to the components of that, you know, the collecting of uh, 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 biomonitoring data, uh, which can support future epidemiology studies. But I, I see epidemiology as really uh, catching the places where the other systems failed and um, you know, it will play a role in hypothesis generation uh, that we can take back to the toxicologist and, and, and exposure assessors and, and say, is this signal that we're seeing in this pattern of disease uh, likely to, to come from an actual um, uh, mechanism and actual uh, chemical toxicity? Thank you. I'm sure the epidemiologists will enjoy that, that answer to that question. <laughs> Could, could I could I just finally ask then? Um, you said that the guidance has been prepared and it's it's been prepared for being been being prepared for the last year or so. Have you any idea when it might be published? Um, nothing from inside the agency. The uh, the group that's doing that is is keeping their cards close to their chest, which which tells me that it's that the administration cares about the guidance and uh, okay. wants to wants to control its its release. So the only thing I would do is uh, the only answer I could give you is what I found by doing a 30 second Google search on the title of the document and found three um, uh, 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 inside EPA rumor uh, documents that say it's coming out the end of this year, beginning of next year. But other than that, I, I have no information other than to say that that it is that I know it's being actively worked on and I do expect it will happen sometime. Uh, in uh, 2021 and 20, or 2022. Excellent. We'll look forward to seeing that document. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. Thank you. So um, we've now heard about the European approach. We've heard about the USA approach. Um, we're now going to hear about the F FAO WHO um, consultation, and that will be from Professor Alan Bubis. So. Alan is Emeritus Professor um, at Imperial College London, and Alan has a, a wealth of experience on multiple advisory committees, um, and currently Alan is the Chair of the Committee on Toxicity in the UK. So Alan, thank you. The floor is yours. Um, thank you, Heather, and um, thank to the uh, EFSA for the opportunity to talk to you today about the FEOW show consultation, um, um, which is um, specifically relating to chemicals and food. 
uh, because FEO, WHO, particularly WHO deals with a variety of media and human exposures, but the Jack van GMPR committees um, specifically deal with residues in food or contaminants in food and advise the Codex Alimentarius um, accordingly on uh, risks and on um, acceptable uh, dietary levels. And uh, this um, activity I'm going to talk about has its uh, main origin in um, Um, a European project called Euromix, which many of you on the call will be uh, familiar with. This was Horizon 2020 funded. It involved 22 European uh, partners and four third party organizations uh, who were from um, outside of Europe, including the US EPA. And it started in 2015 and um, finished um, a couple of years ago. The objective was to develop um, approaches and methods for the assessment of risk posed by combined exposure to multiple chemicals um, and had a fairly broad remit. But a key objective of the project was to identify and promote opportunities to harmonize different approaches taken to such assessments, both within Europe and uh, more widely. And uh, as part of the project, um, the partners developed a freely available web-based toolbox and a handbook to provide databases and methods for the tiered assessment of combined exposure to chemicals, whatever the level of data available in each substance. And um, these will help in uh, hopefully in harmonization. Um, as part of the harmonization activities, uh, we organized a series of four international workshops, um, one in each of the four years of the project. And um, they had a good combination of uh, geographical and um, agency representation. And these are the, the high level conclusions of those workshops. And as you've heard already from Paul Price and others, there's no overarching single approach to the overall risk assessment of combined exposure to chemicals in Europe or, or elsewhere. Although there is ongoing work such as at OECD and EFSA. And the approaches to the risk assessment of combined exposures vary across sectors and with geography, reflecting the needs of the risk manager. Um, one of the main areas of difference, of course, is how chemicals are grouped. And this may be based on structural similarity, co-occurrence in the same product, or in design functions such as they all act as uh, emulsifiers in a, in a, as an additive. The Euromix toolbox and handbook will enable different tiers to be applied for hazard and exposure for both data rich and data poor chemicals. And there are tools available uh, now for um, assessing the implications, that is the uncertainty of uh, making different choices or assumptions in how we deal with the combination of chemicals, how we deal with exposure and how we deal with hazard. Connection lost. Here we go. So, um, to complement Euromix, um, as a separate but related activity, the WHO and FAO convened an expert consultation. And this was to develop appropriate guidance for the risk assessment of combined exposures to multiple chemicals at an international level and to make recommendations for its implementation by the expert committees that I've already mentioned, JECFA and GMPR. Uh, you'll be probably aware that JECFA uh, is actually an umbrella committee which deals with separately additives, contaminants, and residues of veterinary drugs, and GMPR deals with the residues of pesticides. And the aim was to develop a practical approach to the risk assessment of combined exposure to multiple chemicals, which should be piloted by GMPR and JECFA in 2019, because they would meet subsequent to the April workshop. And that was the best, um, first available time to pilot the approach. Um, to, the proposal process 
for applications of substances that are not DNA reactive mutagens because this was um, considered uh, an area where particularly uh, unique considerations apply. And there was a separate group already dealing with this within WHO and FEO. And synerg synergistic interactions between chemicals may need to be considered separately on a case-by-case -case basis as appropriate. Sorry, okay. Uh, this will be on the slide deck. It lists the, the participants. There wasn't a large number of people, but we did have a good geographical and agency representation. So the, the proposed approach that was uh, decided was if a substance under evaluation by Czech for and GMPR in a given year has sufficient similarity to an established chemical group previously considered somewhere by another agency, it should be considered for an assessment as part of that group. So in other words, if a new compound has a triazine structure and mode of action, then it should be considered as part of a triazine group and so on. If not, there needs to be a determination if there is a need to include it in a risk assessment of combined exposure to multiple chemicals. And after some debate, we agreed a pragmatic approach would be appropriate to select chemicals under evaluation by the committee to be included in the pilot exercise prior to developing a final methodology for full-blown implementation at some future date. And this pragmatic approach said that if the estimated dietary exposure for a single compound under evaluation is greater than 10% of its health-based guidance value, its TDI or ADI, then consider the need to include it in a risk assessment of combined exposure to multiple chemicals grouped by similar structure and or mode of action. And I should say that this is not the first time the WHO and FAO have addressed the issue of uh, risk assessment of combined exposure to multiple chemicals. Uh, the International Programme on Chemical Safety um, published a um, generic framework in 2009 that was then uh, published in the peer-reviewed literature a couple of years later and is actually um, the forerunner um, and has been adapted and modified by a number of the frameworks that we've actually been discussing at this workshop today. And that therefore instead of reinventing the wheel it was anticipated that a lot of the actual uh, technical aspects of mixture risk assessment by JECF and GMPR would be uh, conducted following the proposals um, in that report. And in hazard identification and characterization, standard procedures should be followed, including derivation of relative, relative potency factors for chemicals in the assessment group where appropriate. And of course, this requires identification of the members of the assessment group. For dietary exposure, this is quite problematical at a global level because JECFA and GMPR has to um, assess the risk across um, a wide range of jurisdictions um, and many of them are not generating uh, large data sets on things like consumption patterns and so uh, there's a limit to how detailed the exposure assessment can be to take in all different regions and this as we'll see in a moment is going to be a significant factor. It was recommended that if possible a probabilistic approach should be uh, undertaken the different approaches would obviously be needed for chronic and um, acute estimates and for chronic um, use a sort of uh, mean dietary exposure for the general population um, and then um, a mean or a median concentration. In the risk characterization step, um, when we get to that stage, um, suitable procedures using dose addition could be applied. To, and these should be used to identify the key risk drivers using either a deterministic or probabilistic approach. Uh, that would include the key chemicals in a group which contribute to the dietary exposure and or the foods that contribute most to the exposure for each chemical. Um, probabilistic models for single chemicals are now 
quite well readily available uh, in several um, uh, tools, uh, some of them publicly accessible. But there are only a few tools that are publicly available uh, for multiple chemicals. And one of these is the um, RIVM developed um, uh, MCRA uh, software, um, which was refined under Euromix and discussions with RIVM, European Commission and the WHO uh, need to be held to, to try to make sure that this um, toolbox um, and software is uh, readily available for use by the expert committees of WHO and FAO. And um, I'm not sure where those discussions are at the moment, but they have obviously, like many things, been stalled by um, the COVID pandemic. So the, as I said earlier, the strong recommendation is that was that the uh, recommendations of the workshop should be piloted at the JECFA meeting for veterinary residues in 2019, which was the 88th JECFA, and at the 2019 uh, pesticide residues meeting GMPR. And they should identify possible chemicals under evaluation for um, follow-up in the pilot process. And the results of this exercise should then be reviewed at some future date and the approach revised as appropriate based on experience gained with, with one particular consideration was this decision point, this 10% value, which was a pragmatic choice as to allow us to start the process, look to see how much difference it made if we use different percentages, etc. Um, in terms of then implementing the process in the long term, this would be an update of the environmental health criteria 240. Um, we should include requests for completed risk assessment of combined exposure and future data calls in case there are some that we're not aware of um, or have been updated by national agencies. Um, access to suitable tools and computer facilities for probabilistic modeling needs to be made available. And uh, the risk assessments of combined chemical mixtures for chemicals of DNA reactive should refer to the updated chapter four on uh, the assessment of mutagenicity, which has now been published by the WHO uh, on their website. Other recommendations included um, a way of trying to facilitate this whole process of identifying chemicals that might be grouped. And uh, one uh, first step would develop a simple database with a list of parameters to quickly screen. Um, and this would include uh, their health-based guidance values, their critical effects, um, their functional class, mo mode of action if known, um, some estimates of dietary exposure, etc and then uh, follow this up with a more detailed structured database um, of all JEC for GMPR evaluations over the last 15 years um, to allow um, the uh, outcomes of the risk assessment of combined exposure to multiple chemicals to be um, uh, integrated into the common assessment groups and uh, explore the use of common templates, for example, from the EFSA guidance document. And in fact, a, a simple date spreadsheet was prepared for the GMPR 2019 and was used at that meeting. Okay. So, um, the first meeting of the two that we were going to pilot it at was the GMPR in September of 2019. Um, this meeting agreed, so the uh, workshop, the consultation publishes recommendations and these had to be considered in principle by the uh, meetings. Uh, so the GMPR uh, looked at the report, um, considered the recommendations and agreed that it would pilot the approach based on chronic dietary exposure for those compounds that are being evaluated for the first time at the meeting in September. Um, of the eight compounds that were evaluated by GMPR at that time for the first time, the only one for which the estimated dietary exposure exceeded 10% of the ADI was piflubamide. And this does not belong to an established assessment group for the combined exposure to multiple pesticides that we are aware of. Um, and the next step would then to be asked, would 
would be to ask, are there other chemicals uh, that um, are, or other pesticides, I should say, and possibly veterinary drugs, which should be considered in the same grouping with this compound? So that would be the next step and we'll the follow up. Oops, sorry. Um, in, in the, the following month in October, the JEC for, for Residues of Any Drugs met. Um, again, JEC for discussed the workshop report and agreed to pilot the approach based on chronic exposure for compounds being evaluated at the meeting, um, but concluded that two to three years, whoops, that's a lag there. Um, but concluded that uh, given what was being anticipated, the full process uh, would take more than two, a couple of years. And so two to three years would not be sufficient time to judge the utility of the approach at the JECF and GMPR level. Um, and moreover, estimating combined exposure at the international level would be challenging, as we always expect, suspected, with respect to both the availability of suitable data and the application of methodology. For example, where distributions for consumption are only available for some countries and not in others. Um, there were several compounds on the uh, agenda for the October JECFA. Um, but for various reasons, a number of them uh, did not um, have a complete assessment um, finalized uh, because of um, concerns about the compounds or a lack of data. And that meant then there was no point in considering them in cumulative risk assessment since we couldn't even complete an individual risk assessment for those compounds. Um, in fact, uh, now there were only two compounds that were evaluated for both safety and residues. We need the residues to assess the exposure. And these were diflubenzerone and halconol. Um, and neither of them belong to an established assessment group for combined exposure to multiple chemicals. And in neither of the compounds did the estimated dietary exposure from their use as veterinary drugs exceed 10% of the upper bound of the ADI in any of the populations or subpopulations um, assessed. And as a consequence, no further action was considered necessary within this pilot. So in conclusion, the FAO and WHO have developed a pragmatic approach for identifying compounds for which there might be a need for the risk assessment of combined exposures to multiple residues. The approach has been agreed in principle by GM, GMPR and by JECFA, and JECFA contaminants has actually um, looked at the, um, acknowledged the report, but as far as I know, has not yet um, piloted it. And it has been piloted by both GMPR and the residue, uh, veterinary residues part of JECFA to identify candidate compounds that might require such a combined exposure assessment. The next step, identifying suitable data and conducting the assessment of the risk from combined exposures has been hampered by the COVID-19 pandemic. Because although we had virtual meetings of GMPR and JECFA, um, we, they did, it was not possible to carry out this, uh, some of the um, general activity that we would expect or we would, we would anticipate doing at those meetings. And therefore, this has been um, has uh, been delayed until we can meet face to face again. But there are several key issues that will need to be resolved before such an assessment can be completed. And it was considered that even just highlighting the possible need for such an assessment may itself be of value uh, in the output of a GMPR or JEC for a report. And JEC and GMPR will continue to pile this approach whenever feasible. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for that very clear presentation. Um, the, the clicker is somewhat challenging, isn't it? <laughs> it doesn't always work. I'm not kidding. <laughs> well, especially if your phone keeps going blank. <laughs> exactly, it's your phone keeps going off. Yeah. So, can I can I can I start the question? So, um, you mentioned a little bit the Euromix project, and and I was just wondering. I mean, is there is there a follow up to the Euromix project, or has all the work in the toolbox and everything, and um, is is that just waiting to be picked up by, as you say, WHO or Jeff? 
That's an interesting question because, of course, the Euromix project, like some of the other projects launched around the same time on mixtures, were supposed to provide um, actionable methodology for the Commission and for EFSA. The reality is that, as always, um, there are more questions than answers in these projects. They all end up doing proof of principle case studies. Much of the methodology is available and will be applicable. But as far as I'm aware, the Commission is launching new projects on mixture toxicology um, and would hope that in the next cycle, we will be closer to a final resolution to how we should do this and the methodology will be uh, fit for purpose. And, and just sort of following up on that, so, you know, when, when do you think the pilot might be complete? Um, are we thinking three to five years? The WHO Jack for GMPR pilot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the COVID pandemic has really knocked us off uh, schedule um, by a couple of years. I would think realistically three to four years before we can say anything definitive about it, because it's not just identifying the chemicals, it's actually getting the data together at an international yeah. level. Um, and of course, when somebody proposes membership of a CAG, we're going to have to discuss the validity of the CAG at the JEC for GMPR as well. So that will take so a year you. probably. Yeah. So I, I'll now read out a few of the questions that we have. Would WHO FAO suggest to consider known metabolites? Uh, that's a vexed question because, of course, um, WHO and FAO are partnering with OECD in their uh, revision of the um, residue definition, which includes a DCO consideration of how do you assess the risk from metabolites. But it has to be said that, um, with a few exceptions, uh, JECFA and GMPR have not yet looked in detail at including uh, pesticide metabolites or revenue drug metabolites in an assessment group for a full-blown combined risk assessment. I mean, that would be the next phase once we've got the residue definition sorted out and the pilot scheme is underway. Okay. Now, the next question is, uh, do you expect that future cumulative risk assessments by GMPR and JEFCA will be separate by each committee or combined for the future? And since substance, similar substances can be used as pesticides and veterinary medicines, such as organic organophosphates and pyrethroids. Yes, and in fact, even on single chemicals, there's concern that we try to be as close as possible because it wouldn't be. Um, there are many many situations where um, the conclusions would be common to both committees. Uh, so I think um, the Secretariat of FEO and WHO will be working closely across the committees to try to ensure that we harmonize to the extent possible. And in fact, uh, we would do a combined uh, cumulative assessment if that is feasible and sensible. Good. Next question. Um, the availability of individual consumption data is noted as an issue. Is the FAO WHO GIFT database used by the JMP, JMPR and JEFCA for probabilistic modeling? Sorry, could you, I miss the last bit of the question, Heather? So the, the, yes, so the, the availability of individual consumption data is noted as an issue. Is the FAO WHO GIFT database used by the JMPR and JEFCA for probabilistic modeling? Well, some of it's suitable, and in fact, uh, some of it has been used uh, for um, proof of principle um, assessments. But as I, I mean, I'm not an exposure expert, but my understanding is that there are parts of that, or parts of the consumption data that are used by WHO and FEO in their exposure assessments, which would not be suitable for looking at uh, uh, distributions of consumption. And so it wouldn't be possible to do a full-blown full -blown probabilistic assessment. And so one of the questions we're going to have to address and going forward is, is there some way we can use surrogate data 
could we think about reading across from one data set to another? But that's for the experts to look at. And that's one of the questions, as I say, we hope the pilot will be able to address. Excellent, excellent. So that's all the questions, um, unless there are any more to come through on the um, programme, on the Q&A platform. Um, I think not. And we are slightly ahead of time. So our next um, our next event is actually the coffee break. So we will have an extra five minutes in our in our coffee break, and we will resume our activities at fifteen forty, please. So enjoy your coffee break now.
Hello everyone and welcome back. Our next presenter is Patience Brown, who leads um, the Hazard Assessment and Pesticide Safety Programmes at the Environmental Health and Safety Division of OECD in Paris. So Patience, the floor is yours. Thank you. Conference organizers for inviting me to present today, and I'm delighted to give a brief update on some of the activities at OECD around combined exposure to multiple chemicals. And with that, hopefully, perfect, great, thank you. Super, so I'm gonna start a little bit by just touching on some of the activities around mixtures that are taken up in the test guidelines program, even though this is really very limited. And I should say, while well, most test methods should be amenable to mixtures, generally mixtures are not tested during the validation process. So there is standard language included in many of the test guidelines as follows. The test method was validated using single chemicals, therefore the applicability to test mixtures has not been addressed. The test method is nevertheless theoretically applicable to the testing multi-constituent multi chemicals and mixtures. And while, as I said, this really hasn't been undertaken as an OECD activity during the validation process, I'd just like to bring a little bit of attention to some external activities that have been taken up recently. For example, the test of agrochemical formulations in in vitro and ex vivo methods for eye irritation. Uh, this is a publication just from this year that was led by the National Toxicology Program, US EPA and the JRC. And this really looked at uh, some of the things that we'll talk about a bit later that are taken up in other programs. Oops. Great. Most of the work that's taken up at OECD on chemical mixtures is either taken up in the hazard assessment program or as joint projects between the working parties on hazard assessment and the working parties on exposure assessment. And one of the large recent undertakings was this document on considerations for assessing the risks of combined exposure to multiple chemicals that was published in very late 2018. And I'd like to touch a little bit on what is and isn't covered in this document. Sorry, it's hard to get used to the clicker. There we go. So really, as with most OECD documents, this is meant to be generally applicable at a high level to both regulators and the regula regulated community. So just a brief mention on what the document is and what it is not. It is really meant to be an overview of the technical aspects of various approaches and methodologies for assessing combined exposures. This draws from approaches applied and experiences gained in the regulatory context, but it is not really strict guidance at all. It is aspects to consider in assessing combined exposures to multiple chemicals. And these concepts are really presented at a general level that can be taken up in a variety of contexts and chemical sectors. There are, however, multiple assessment scenarios of different types of combined exposures that are included in the document, and one can think of these really as case studies to illustrate the various approaches. The document covers both human and environmental risk assessments. Uh, however, I think there's full acknowledgement that aspects developed in one field may be uh, more mature than those in others, uh, and that is covered to some degree in the document as well. Certainly, non-chemical stressors are out of focus for this particular document. These include things like disease state, nutritional status, diet, physiological stressors, abiotic stressors, et cetera, which certainly can contribute, but are, are certainly out of what was covered. So the document really presents a framework for combined exposure assessment, and it has sort of various steps that are described. I'm going to touch upon these generally and then go into just a very little bit of detail on each of these. So at the outset, there is identification of potential scenarios for assessment of risk from combined exposures. The next step in that is to formulate the assessment question, to determine the scope of the assessment, to identify the data that are available, or if necessary, generate additional data, and to evaluate the data and potential for co-exposure. The combined exposure assessment and the combined hazard assessment are really meant to be done in parallel in the document. Uh, these are both approached in a tiered 
fashion, starting with conservative assumptions and progressing until the regulatory question can be answered. The idea is that more and more data are added at each tier and the uncertainty decreases with the additional data. Uh, at the conclusion of these assessment steps, there is a risk characterization and there it may result in a need to modify the scope of the assessment or gather additional information to actually determine uh, a conclusion. And then in the final stage, there's focus on the outcome of the assessment and there's some discussion of identification and documentation of the key uncertainties. And I'll touch upon that in a little bit more detail as we go through. Covered in the document are two fundamental approaches, and the, I'm sure these have been covered in other talks. The first of these is a whole mixture approach, or WMA. Uh, this considers a group as a single unit, and there are some assumptions inherent in this. This includes things like an assumption that components and concentrations of those components don't vary over time. They don't vary among individuals, nor do they vary between exposure routes. And the toxicity studies conducted are conducted on the whole mixture. In contrast, the second sort of general fundamental approach, if you will, is the, is the uh, component-based approach. In this approach, effects of the, groups are, of the group is based on the individual components. There is a need to select an appropriate model for calculating toxicity, and this is really based on the assumptions about mode of action or adverse outcome pathways. These include things like the dose addition or concentration addition model, which assumes a similar AOP or mode of action for a given endpoint of the components and assumes no interaction between the co-occurrence of the components. The second possibility is a response addition or an independent action approach, where chemicals have dissimilar modes of action or toxicologically independent components. And it assumes that one chemical does not influence the toxicity of another. Uh, this is appropriate for groups of substances that are acting differently or inherently independently on apical endpoints and where the mode of action may not be very well known. In the third option, there are models that take into account interaction between substances where the substance influences the toxicity of one another. So these deviate from the other two models. And these include things like uh, synergistic models and antagonistic models as well. I should say that in many cases, the dose addition model is considered kind of the most conservative approach, and it's the one that's often used in the regulatory setting. The approach chosen at the outset will necessarily alter the elements of hazard and exposure, as well as, of course, the risk characterization and other data needs. And the document sets up uh, this approach as an initial step, but then provides information on how this decision may affect considerations throughout the various other sections of the document. So to go into each of these in just a little bit of detail, for the problem formulation and scoping, this is really where the uh, regulators identify the question to be answered and its scope. There is a determination of the need to conduct confined exposure assessments and to discuss a little bit about the decision-making process that's involved in that step. In the problem formulation step, there is the step to determine whether to conduct a risk assessment of combined exposures in the first place. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this involves evidence regarding the co-exposure or co-occurrence of chemicals, including things like direct measure of monitoring data, measuring substances in the same medium, as well as uh, data on the likelihood of finding co-occurrence of substances based on release or fade information, as well as market penetration information and how the chemicals are used. There's consideration of intentionally produced mixtures. So these are products that contain several components, and usually these are products of known composition, including things like pesticide formulations or cosmetic finished products, commercial mixtures of industrial chemicals, and so forth. And then in, also included under this step is information on intended uses for regulated substances, and with the acknowledgement that these are potentially under multiple different legislations. So in addition to, as I mentioned, that these are really done in parallel, in addition to evidence regarding the co-exposure, there's evidence regarding the common hazard. So these are questions like, are the chemicals causing the same or similar adverse effects on the target organs? Do we expect the biology to be the same? Are chemicals known to follow the same AOP or MOA? Are they following different AOPs, but 
affect the same target organism, or do they share one or more key events in an AOP? So these really determined the types of approaches that are applied. And then the last involved in the hazard assessment stage here is, is there evidence suggesting that compounds may interfere with relevant metabolic pathways? So in this initial stage, there's also the definition of the scope of the risk assessment of combined exposures, where the boundaries for the hazard and exposure regulatory considerations are identified. The next step in this are the tandem hazard and exposure characterizations. As I mentioned, these are conducted in parallel. There is a tiered approach applied to both elements, and these progress, as I mentioned previously, with increasing data until the regulatory question can be answered or data limits further refinement, at which point more data may be generated. In this step, to evaluate hazard key considerations for grouping chemicals into hazard uh, categories are described in the document, including things like structural similarities, similarities in toxicological or biological response effects, considerations for incorporating chemicals with limited data, which is often the case, the document also discusses using this tiered approach and considerations for assessing potency. It discusses interactions of chemicals and influence of potency. In the discussion of exposure, there are factors that affect co-exposure, such as sources, use patterns, and life cycles of exposure, pathways and routes of exposure, components such as physical chemical and fate properties of the chemicals themselves or the mixtures, there's a discussion on the magnitude, frequency, and duration of exposure, as well as specific target populations and the toxicokinetic considerations. There are, is a discussion of the data available for evidence of co-exposures, including the data types and the data sources, how to interpret monitoring data, and data needs limitations and uncertainty as one moves through these steps for exposure assessment. So these are really, while the specifics may be different, they're organized in a quite similar fashion. Next. For what I hit. Apologies for that. Thank you. In the risk characterization discussion, there is a discussion on characterizing the risk from combined exposures to multiple chemicals with an aim to identify where there are concerns. Uh, there's also identifying and quantifying the magnitude of risks of the combined exposures and the conditions under which such risks are likely to manifest using a weight of evidence approach that considers multiple lines of evidence. There's identification of the groups of chemicals that are particularly important drivers and should be targeted by risk management activities or controls, and an illustration of the use of tiered approaches to assess the risk of combined exposures to humans or the environment. And as I mentioned, the assumption is always starting with less data and fewer resources, increasing accuracy as more data are accumulated and one moves through the risks or moves through the tiers rather. Documenting the uncertainties is a, is a very important consideration when one considers what the uncertainties are when assessing exposure to mixtures. Certainly all of the uncertainties of assessing individual chemicals are there, plus a number of additional considerations, such as the accuracy with which components have been characterized, the accuracy with which the exposure has been characterized, the evidence supporting the co-exposure, evidence supporting common hazards, and assumptions about additivity or lack thereof and the shape of the dose response curves. Methods used to fill data caps, uh, such as read across or allometric scaling, PBK modeling, or other alternative approaches. And generally, it's acknowledged that the uncertainties are greater for ecological risk assessment than human health assessment when we're looking at combined exposure to mixtures. Certainly, ecological risk assessment are inherently more complex, including different species, different sensitivities, with, of course, different vulnerabilities and the potential for chemicals or mixtures acting through different modes of action. So key to all of these uncertainties is how these are documented. So one needs to identify the key limitations, uncertainties, or sorry, 
assumptions and uncertainties associated with the approach used in the assessment. They need to consider the magnitude and impact of the sources of uncertainty and if reductions would be likely to lead to a different outcome in a regulatory context. The uncertainty analysis, like other steps in the process, should follow a tiered approach that can be refined as necessary and as data become available. And they should be communicated in a way that is understandable to the decision makers taking up the assessment. So when we look at takeaway from the documents, that there's certainly a number of limitations and uncertainties associated with the various approaches. They have different strengths and weaknesses. And this is also true with single substance assessments as well. There is a hope to gain experience from using these methods and identifying key gaps and uncertainty during application. And OECD really has the potential to serve, serve as a forum for discussing these and sharing the information. But application of the approaches will help to build the experiences and refine methodologies moving forward. So this is kind of the general guidance document. I want to discuss things that have come out as new projects and more recent endeavors as well. The first of these was a project that began in 2020 under our e at Chem Portal electronic tool. This was development of a website, and this was a direct recommendation of the working parties on hazard assessment and exposure assessment. Uh, and this is really a, a request for case studies on risk assessment of combined exposures to multiple chemicals to OECD delegates. The initial request was circulated in 2020. Uh, we received relatively limited responses. There was a few case studies that were offered from WHO and from the ILSI Helsi workshop a few years ago, but there were more responses that were received in 2021. These were from EFSA and US EPA. You can see these listed here. There were a number of references. These are available both in tabular form of the individual components when identified and a link to the uh, references are embedded in ECAM portal for those interested. Also a few projects that are uh, potentially relevant to evaluating combined exposures to multiple chemicals are joint projects that were taken up in the hazard assessment and exposure assessment groups. One of these is an occupational biomonitoring to assess risks due to exposures in the workplace. This project is led by Switzerland in uh, cooperation with over 39 institutions that represent a variety of countries. There's recognition that the national approaches used here are highly variable and there's no harmonized guidance for biomonitoring. So the goals of the project include comparing existing methods on deriving occupational biomonitoring levels, identifying data gaps and future research needs, proposing quality criteria and minimum uh, requirements for OBLs, including toxicokinetic data, uh, elaborating general tiered guidance on derivation of OBLs with respect to accepted points of departure that are used in risk assessments, proposing different OBL derivation methods for screening purposes and for a more advanced regulatory assessment contexts. Again, that tiered approach with expecting more data and lower uncertainty as one moves through the process. Recommendation, uh, or sorry, recommending general biomonitoring options in occupational settings and providing characterization and outlook for the use of effects based biomonitoring. Uh, this project has really matured quite a bit. There is an upcoming meeting of the expert group in December, and we expect to have a draft document for review in the OECD reviewing rounds in early 2022. There's also a joint project under exposure and hazard assessment that was initially led by Canada. And since they proposed the project, they have been joined by Germany, Switzerland, and the Netherlands as co-leads. This project on occupational exposure limits is intended to examine approaches and guidance for OEL development. So a survey was circulated to collect information on how occupational exposure limits are established in different jurisdictions including the role of governments and other groups and lessons learned, how priorities for OEL development are set in those different jurisdictions. Uh, it's meant to document approaches for development of exposure limits in the workplace, identify current chemicals and occasionally mixtures with exposure, existing workplace exposure limits and roles of monitoring and modeling in the development of workplace exposure limits. This survey was circulated in 2021. The leads are finalizing a draft report. And again, this is expected to circulate in 2022 for broader OECD comments. 
the hope is that this report will help lead to the next steps, which including explore exploring opportunities to harmonize OEL development and identify areas for collaboration, potentially through some pilot case studies. But perhaps most excitingly, or uh, let's just say most um, kind of involving the new approach methods, include is, includes a project that was just proposed this year, which is kind of a how these all develop into one another, how the guidance can be used and the previous projects can be used to develop something uh, more predictive and more sophisticated using uh, adverse outcome pathways to address combined exposures to chemicals using biomarkers. This has many of the same leads of the previous projects. Switzerland, the US, Netherlands, and Luxembourg are leads, but there are many other cooperative partners involved in this. This also, I should say, is a joint project under both hazard assessment and exposure assessment, along with the cooperation of the EGMIS group at OECD. The intention is to evaluate known and unknown component, components of mixtures using effects biomarkers and improve the understanding of biomarker relevance to apical hazards and what levels of responses indicate a strong probability for hazard. So really, these are we're really developing into predictive models, if you will, and using the AOP framework to do so. So that was just a brief overview of the current activities, recent and current activities, I should say. All of these projects, uh, once they are finalized or if they have been finalized, are available publicly and free of charge through the OECD iLibrary and various websites indicated here. Uh, and the frequent updates about developments and new uh, guidance documents and, and case studies, as well as addition to the ECHEM portal, are available through the EHS newsletter. So with that, I'll pause and see if there are any questions and hope to be able to answer them. Thank, thank you very much, Patience. That's great. So it's good to see that the ESSA project and the OECD projects have similar um, styles, if you like, and are, are looking at similar similar things. And can I just ask? And um, you mentioned human bi human biomonitoring, and and I think if I'm I'm right, there is a a human biomonitoring EU project HBM four 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 EU. Um, is that is the OECD part of that, or is that a separate project? That is a separate project. So uh, as was mentioned uh, in Alan's talk, and I'm sure in other places as well, there are a variety of, uh, let's say, concurrent projects that have not yet come directly to OECD. The hope is that many of these deliverables will be proposed as future work, or at least come to be described if, to share experiences. We do hear updates on some of those projects in our meetings, and oftentimes leads on the, uh, for instance, the European Commission projects are invited to present on those, but there's not yet a direct link between the two. Okay, thank you. So um, we have one question, um, which it says, please explain OBL. Ex <laughs> occupational biomonitoring. Uh, I wish yeah. I could do a little bit better than uh, I'm afraid I'm going to be able to. Uh, part of the issue is that there are different approaches taken in different jurisdictions. So I think the initial uh, survey is intended to not only describe, but also catalog how jurisdictions and different regulatory authorities define that and what models are used. And I'm afraid I simply can't get into much more detail. It's a little bit out of my wheelhouse. Okay, no problem. You, you can't know everything. <laughs> um, another question. For 2021 joint project, what effect biomarkers are you thinking about? Do you have any examples? You know, I, I really don't have a lot of detail to offer on that one, and I apologize for that as well. Most of the work has been taken up in subgroups and has been largely external to OECD. We're very impressed with the amount of work that has been done, but there has been a lot of discussion on using validated bio effects biomarkers. Uh, and there's still some discussion, particularly on the AOPs, on what may be the best candidates. As I mentioned, this is uh, for that project that was that was proposed in 2021. This is really in its early stages. And in fact, the development of that project will depend a little bit on the project that's led by Switzerland and others uh, to investigate the available effects biomarkers and select candidates. I think the involvement of the EGMIST group is very helpful since there's perhaps a more broad view of other supporting data for thing things like omics and uh, high throughput data that help to support the validity of some of those. But that is a, an active area under discussion. OK, um, another question um, on occupational exposure this time. Did you take the 
TVOC concept into account. This is the the fear of asking technical questions of somebody who's at a very general level. I'm afraid I can I'd be happy to respond to that question as a follow up, but I'm I'm simply not able to right now. Apologies. Okay, so uh, we do have another question. Um, has the impact <laughs> on? Yeah, don't don't worry. <laughs> um, has the impact on dose addition of substances interacting with different locations along AOPs been investigated? So what they're saying, so two structurally dissimilar substances could have unrelated threshold processes, but dose addition considers 100% of the dose of the second substance to be effective. To my knowledge, there's been very limited evaluation of the effect of multiple chemicals using an AOP framework. So this is really part of the excitement of this new project that's been proposed. To the extent that I'm aware, uh, this is really combining things that have been under development for some time, but is new, at least in the OECD context. So I am not aware of any previous information that has taken this approach, but hopefully we'll have more to report in a year or so. Okay, thank you very much. So I think um, from what I can see on my other screen, um, that's all the questions for just now, patients. So thank you very much indeed. And we will move to our next speaker. So our next speaker is Stephanie Bott. Stephanie is a project leader at the EC, the European Commission Joint Center Research Center in ISPRA in Italy. And she is part of the Chemical Safety and Alternative Methods Group. And uh, Stephanie is going to talk to us about the GRC uh, European Research Lab exam activities on combined exposures to multiple chemicals. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Heather. So uh, I will talk to you about our activities in the area of, of mixtures, the activities of our unit, including the European Reference Lab for Alternatives to Animal Testing. And um, our activities started or were driven by the recommendations and actions outlined in the Commission communication of 2012 on chemical mixtures. So that was the basis for us to start our activities. Based on that, we did several reviews and activities to fill data gaps and knowledge gaps feeding also into the Commission chemical strategy for sustainability and the related staff working document on mixtures, which were published last year in October. And maybe I need to, to mention here that our activities are not focused on a specific area or uh, chemical legislation. So it can be food related, but it can be also on industrial chemicals, cosmetics and whatever. So we are not focused on a specific area, but working on general methodology. Um, then uh, I will give you a very brief overview of our activities that were going on uh, in the last years, but then I will focus on the more recent activities. So uh, we started with a review of regulatory requirements and available guidance to look at uh, how chemicals are assessed in different pieces of EU chemical legislation. And we saw that uh, manufactured mixtures, so-called intentional mixtures, are often addressed, but still unintentional mixtures are rarely covered. And the only very good example we saw was the, uh, or the main good example was the pesticide residues. And we are all aware of the work of EFSA to develop methodology to address those and, and the progress made in the recent years. Um, then we looked into scientific methodologies and current practices. Uh, and especially into the possible use of new approach methodologies to facilitate mixture hazard assessment. And I will address that with some examples later on more in detail. Then another activity was focused on case studies and uh, looking into what is currently applied, which guidance is used and what is hampering the assessments. And we see that there are several methodologies that can be used, but often if, for example, a risk is identified, it's difficult to go to higher tier refinements. And uh, that is mainly because of data gaps, both on the exposure and on the hazard side. And then the last activity I want to mention and uh, maybe it addresses some of the questions we heard before. We were working together with many different EU funded research projects on mixtures like the HPM for EU human biomonitoring project, the Euromix, which was mentioned before, also the EDC mix risk and the solutions project to facilitate the exchange between the risk assessors, policymakers and scientists to discuss scientific advances and what methodologies might be uh, 
sorry, might be uh, in a position to, to be already taken up in a policy context. And an overview on these projects uh, was published by, by all of us together in 2018 and a statement how to tackle mixtures from the projects followed in 2020. And now I would like to show you uh, a bit more about our activities on addressing data and knowledge gaps, focusing a bit on what we do in terms of uh, supporting exposure assessment and then in terms of um, new approach methodologies and also looking into interactions, which we heard about before. So um, in in the Commission communication on mixtures from 2012, one of the major knowledge gaps identified was our lack of knowledge of the real exposure patterns. And to address this gap, the Commission started building IPCHEM, the Commission Information Platform for Chemical Monitoring, which we host in our unit since uh, 2019. And IPCHEM was built as a single access point for searching, accessing and retrieving chemical occurrence data collected and managed in Europe and beyond. And you can find it under this um, web address here on the bottom of the slide. So, and what is in it for you? What can you find in IPCHEM? So, um, we, you, it's a, a source of chemical occurrence data across different media. And at the moment, we cover more than 450 million uh, concentration measurements for more than 3,000 substances. Uh, we are also connected to the ECAM portal of the OECD. Um, in terms of the data, you see from the yellow bars here that the most populated module is the environmental module, where we have most of our measurements in soil, air, water, sediments, and so on. Then we have the module on the right um, on food and feed which we run in collaboration with EFSA as the module coordinator. And with the help of EFSA, we managed to get in a lot of data, for example, on pesticide residues in food, veterinary medicinal product residues, contaminants, and so on. So also this uh, module is now quite well populated and we have many more data in the pipeline. Then you see between the two, uh, the module on indoor air and, and products. There we have only three data collections at the moment, but there is a new call and new projects on indoor air quality uh, from EU funding are supposed to start next year. And we would hope to, to boost that module then. And also we have the human biomonitoring module, which we populate in collaboration with the HBM for EU project. Uh, we developed together templates for metadata and data, and we are now getting the first data in. So soon we will get the first data publicly available that were collected by HBM for EU. And what is also important to, to keep in mind is that the data are harmonized to some extent to allow looking at the data across different uh, media. And we do some quality checks, but of course we also rely on our data providers to do some first quality checks. For each of the data sets, we publish a metadata describing the data sets further, including contact points that uh, can be contacted for further information. And if possible, from a legal perspective, and if the data providers are willing, we try to share as much as we can the data publicly. At the moment, we have owned about 70% of our data sets that are publicly available. Uh, then you might be interested in how to use IPCAM. So uh, you can start a search uh, looking for a specific chemical name or a CAS number. You can refine the search by the medium or a country and then start to display the relevant data on a map. And you can then do some further filtering and prepare the data for download and offline processing. We also have a, a tool to search for monitoring data starting from a specific city or location to allow exploring patterns of exposure to multiple chemicals, but we need to admit that this is still a pilot version that we need to further develop. Um, IPCHEM tries to address different needs to help addressing policy questions like looking into time and spatial trends, to look into monitoring compliance and targeting intervention, to look at the impact of regulatory intervention and, and uh, to support regulatory risk assessment. And of course, of course, this can all be done for single substances as well as for aggregate and combined exposures because we cover the different media. But now I would like to move on to the toxicity side and our activities related to new approach methodologies. So we are often facing knowledge and data gaps on the toxicity side, as, as I mentioned before. And uh, I think we heard that many people think new approach methodologies have a high potential here to support us 
because it's impossible to test all mixtures experimentally and we need uh, better strategies to, to address potential hazards using new tools, relying less on in vivo testing and uh, also allowing us to get a better understanding of the underlying mechanisms. And uh, their um, AOPs are one of the tools we need to, to make sense then and to integrate the data that come from, from the different uh, tools like in vitro testing, high throughput testing, testing, omics, QSARs, also considering toxicokinetic information is important then. And we can map our information on these networks and uh, see which chemicals might need to be grouped together. We can identify gaps in, in the data and uh, targeted testing needs and see um, how we could move on to fill these gaps. And I want to show you one example of our recent activities where we looked into mixtures of uh, developmental neurotoxicants and the idea was to build a better on a battery of in vitro assays that are anchored to common key events in uh, an AOP network with the adverse outcome of impaired learning and memory in children and we used um, IPC derived human neural glial cultures to to look at those endpoints and uh, the idea was to have uh, several chemicals combined at levels that individually are not producing any neurotoxic uh, effects and just check if, if then we see effects in the mixtures. And for that, um, my colleagues uh, Francesca Pistolato and Anna Price were working mainly on that and they selected the chemicals to be included here uh, that had to fulfill several criteria. So first of all, the compounds uh, needed to cause cognitive impairment as an adverse outcome and to go through different identified common key events in the AOPs. Then we wanted to include chemicals representing different chemical classes falling in under different pieces of legislation and also to use chemicals for which we know they appear in, in human samples. So where we have evidence of their presence in human biomonitoring. And then we try to group those chemicals into what we call similar and dissimilar mode of action. Then uh, I have this bit complex slide. When we start from the lower part, you see the AOP network. So there is seven. there are seven established AOPs that merge at some point to common key events that all lead to the same Edwards outcome of um, impaired um, learning and memory. And we see that the common key events are the altered uh, BDNF levels, the brain-derived neurotrophic factor levels, uh, altered synaptogenesis and altered neuronal network function. And uh, we selected chemicals, you see them on the top in green, that we call the so-called similar chemicals that all act through all the three common key events and decrease the BDNF levels, or through the acting on the BDNF levels. And um, these are chlorpyrifos, uh, bisphenol A, ethanol, lead, and BDE uh, 47. And then we had the other five, which were selected to also cause the same adverse outcome, but not affecting the BDNF levels, but the other key events, yes. And these were vinclozolin, valproic acid, metal mercury, and PCB 138 and TCDD. And then we, uh, combined those and I can just show you a, a few examples because we looked at so many endpoints and, and different time points and so on. So I just give you a, a brief uh, insight here. So this is an example where you see on the, uh, on the graph the results of the single chemicals which, should, uh, which was, were supposed to produce uh, low or no effects. And then we on the right hand side you see the mixtures of the five similar compounds, the five so-called dissimilar compounds, and the mixture of all 10 compounds. And we see that we have a clear increase of neuride length by the mixture of the five compounds and the 10 compounds, uh, less so for the five dissimilar ones. And uh, we need to keep in mind that there is also one chemical that in alone, or valproic acid, that caused a slight increase here. But we see a, a clear effect of the mixture. Another example is from the um, from looking at electrical activity. So you see that the individual chemicals on the left side, they didn't cause any effect on the electrical activity, but uh, we see the mixtures on the right, 
they led to an incre decrease of electrical activity by the mixture of the five similar compounds and the 10 all compounds together. Uh, we need to keep in mind that BDE caused some effects individually, as you see here under the red arrow. So we consider BDE 47 here as the main driver of the mixture effects. To, to put together some conclusions, it, it's difficult to wrap it up because there are so many small details to, to consider, but we see that we can establish a system where we have uh, an AOP guided selection of in vitro assays anchored to the common key events, permitting the mechanistic understanding of, of what is happening here. We saw that low concentrations below the lowest observed adverse effect levels of single chemicals uh, led in combination to effects, uh, especially for the chemicals working through the similar, really similar mode of action uh, with all the common key events. And we saw that the system that we used, the human IPSC uh, derived neurons and astrocyte cultures exposed to chemical mixtures at low concentration, reproduced features that are also described in, in real in new developmental deficits. Like we saw the increased BDNF levels, we saw a higher percentage of neurons and astrocytes and decreased synapses. And with that, I would move to the next part, which was uh, our activity on uh, trying to look a bit closer into interaction, so synergistic and antagonistic effects. And we heard about it before. Our reason for doing this, another systematic review here, was that there is a debate going on since long on how relevant such synergistic effects are. And several reviews have been carried out before but all were focusing on some specific areas, like only looking into specific groups of chemicals or specific, um, uh, only looking into mammalian assays or only looking into ecotoxicity and so on. And we wanted to, to look into the overall uh, picture in studies um, of, that were published over the last um, 10 years. So our um, coverage was from 2007 to 2017, more or less, uh, the, the papers included. And the idea was to, to really look into toxicology and ecotoxicology and to not rely on the interpretation of the data by the study author, but to recalculate those response and combined effects where needed. And then to look how often do synergistic effects occur at which concentration levels and how large are the deviations from the predicted effects. And we did that with the help of, um, of a contractor that was uh, uh, Olven Martin, Andreas Kortenkamp and the team in Brunel University. And they screened, uh, they found like uh, in their search, uh, they started from more than 10,000 papers and narrowed that down according to strict criteria, ending up with more than 1,000 experiments. And for 389 of these experiments, they had the data to reappraise them. So then uh, the uh, calculation were done to, to look at the comparison between uh, comparing predicted effect doses to the observed effect doses. And if there was a deviation of uh, more than twofold, it was considered as a deviation from additivity. So based on these 389 experiments, we saw that um, most of the studies, 65% fell into this uh, ratio of a factor within of two deviations. So they would, according to the, our definition, be additive. And then we saw that about 20% fell on the synergistic side and 15% uh, on the antagonistic side. And if, we, if um, deviations occurred, if they were large, it was more likely that it was on the synergistic end. Um, then uh, we also looked at other parameters, of course, to see, for example, one of the questions was, um, is it the same ratio of uh, deviations from additivity if we consider um, mixtures of only two or three compounds or if we compare it to larger, or more complex mixtures? But unfortunately, with the underlying database that we had, it was impossible to conclude on that because most of the studies, 80% of the studies, are looking only at mixtures of two to three compounds. So in order to uh, conclude here overall, we can say most of the studies were considered additive and deviations were slightly more frequent in in vitro studies. Uh, if deviations occurred, they were mostly small with an effect of uh, three to four. 
but also large deviations occurred. And if so, there were more synergisms than antagonisms. Um, the strong synergisms were sometimes at effect doses that were 50 to 100 times lower than expected based on dose addition. We wanted also to look into uh, how reliable these studies are. And uh, the Brunel University developed a tool to look into the risk of bias of these studies. And 47% of the synergistic or antagonistic studies, mixture studies, were had a higher risk of bias. But we need to keep in mind that in the overall uh, mixture studies classified as additive, this ratio was 38.5% and that was not statistically significant. When we think about the chemical groups that appeared in those um, synergistic cases that were really strong deviations, there were a number of cases with endocrine disruptors, but the mechanistic basis was unclear. And there were a few cases for metals like chromium-6 with cadmium and nickel with cadmium, and a confirmation for which was already reported before of chemical combinations such as triazens, azoles, and pyrethrides. And since we were also interested to look into particularly uh, evidence for synergisms at low doses close to the point of departure, we looked specifically into that, but there were no new studies identified that were not already covered in the last review by Alan Bubis from 2011. So there was nothing to add here. And therefore we think we can confirm that overall the default application of a dose or concentration addition uh, is, is, is quite a good approach. But of course, we need to be careful, especially for those chemicals where we see very often that there is a synergistic potential of these specific classes of chemicals. And we need, of course, to keep in mind that um, we, we don't cover all chemical classes here in the database underlying this review. So it's mainly based on well-studied chemicals like um, pesticides, biocides, metals, and other more well-known chemical groups. And with this, I would like to, to conclude and to thank um, all the people here listed that contributed to this work uh, over the years in JRC and also from Brunel University for the work on interactions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. That's, that's great and, and very, very comp comprehensive. So um, we have some time for some questions. Um, it does seem as if my program and the final program are slightly different, <laughs> but never mind. We will, we will get there in the end. So can I, can I just ask you, um, you talked about your EOPs when you were developing your um, developmental and neurotoxicity study, and you said established EOPs, and I wonder if you meant established or actually validated and approved EOPs? Were they just EOPs have... that have are being developed or were they ones that have been sort of tested and tried and validated? Well, to be honest, uh, this is um, was mainly taken care of that part of by my colleagues. I th I, I'm not sure that they are really approved, but uh, I think they are quite well underpinned at least. <laughs> So, are there are there other questions for Stephanie? It seems that you have uh, explained this very well, Stephanie. There's uh, no question on my on my list. Ah, you have done extremely well. Or it was too complicated. <laughs> no, quest no questions at the moment is, is, is what's coming through, yes. I'm, I'm sure there will be other questions later and there will be the possibility for asking questions in a more general sense at the plenaries. Um, what one question has popped up and that is, did specific classes of chemicals show synergistic or antagonistic effects? In our review, yeah. Probably. Um, yeah, so there were, um, as I mentioned, there were uh, some observed for um, the, the, for the, we, we specifically looked at those that were stronger deviations from additivity and there were some EDs like parabens were there, but it was from an in vitro study and uh, it was not so clear what, what would be the underlying mechanism. There were um, some examples for metals, chromium and um, 
uh, nickel and cadmium, and then we saw some pesticides that had also appeared before in other studies as, uh, as uh, leading to synergistic effects. Okay. Um, thank you. I think that's helpful. Okay. Um, there are no other questions at the moment. So, okay. without further ado, thank you very much. Um, I would like to now thank all five of our plenary speakers. Um, we've heard now what EFSA's approach is, the US EPA, um, OECD, FAO, WHO approach, and also um, from Stephanie there, the approach from ECLAN. So what we're going to do now is to move from there to Jean-Louis Dorn from EFSA who is a senior scientific officer at EFSA in the Scientific Committee on Emerging Risks group. And Jean is, um, Jean Luc focuses on chemical risk assessment and toxicity, and he's going to introduce the breakout groups. And after, after Jean Luc's presentation, we will have a 10 minute break, a 10 minute rest before we start the breakout groups. And when, when you go into the breakout groups, um, the chair will then close the breakout groups at the, at the end of the session. So cheers for each breakout session. So Jean-Lou, thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Heather. I'd like to present the, the way we're going to handle the discussion groups. But first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Heather very much for presenting all the speakers and all the speakers for their presentations. In addition, uh, I'd like to thank all the colleagues that have been involved in organizing this uh, this conference. I seem to have a slight pro problem with my camera. So just as a general piece of information, uh, all the participants received breathing notes with questions and discussion, discussion points. Of course, uh, we have quite a lot of to go through during this workshop. So we would recommend to focus the discussion and allow efficient reporting. Uh, of course, discussion group, reporters in collaboration with the chair will report back to the plenary. It is an open scientific debate. Input from each participant is highly recommended. And we can, we can see that we have around 30 to 35 participants in, in each discussion group. So, of course, this workshop is not to an attempt to agree on details of a strategy or aiming at identifying who is right and who is wrong. And in science, often there are lots of in-betweens. But it's a multidisciplinary scientific debate aiming at identifying and acknowledging existing gaps in data and methodologies. Clicker. To give you an, a slight overview, um, we have a total of 136 participants from 42 countries, which is highly impressive. Four discussion groups and three breakout sessions, of course. Uh, here we just give you the name of the chair and the reporters. First, uh, the first group, Joseph Schlatter and Manuela Testai. The second group, Suzanne Hugard and Antonio Hernandez. Third group, Angelo Moretto and Kiriaki Makera. And the fourth group, Emilio Benfenati and Jan Dirk Tebis Beck. I hope Clicker will function. It's disconnected, so I will attempt to reconnect. OK, so in brief, um, just to wrap up a little bit uh, the, the first presentations and to give you an overview, so we are dealing with an international workshop on risk assessment of combined exposure to multiple chemicals. We have three breakout sessions. The first one dealing with hazard-based criteria to group chemicals into assessment groups. The second, the second one on prioritization methods. And the third one on future challenges. We have four discussion groups. Of course, the outcome of the dis discussion group will be presented at the plenary. And we will have a plenary discussion. This will then conclude in a summary report, and we do hope that this work will identify future work at EFSA, but also stimulate future work elsewhere in other institutions.
And with this, uh, the presentation outcome, so presentation will be presented at the plenary session with a short web story on the EFSA website and check also our micro website. And in 2022, we will publish a summary report on the EFSA website and in booklet format. And with this, I would like to wish you an open and constructive discussion. Of course, to connect to the breakout rooms and plenary uh, on the right hand side of the workshop summary page, you, you can click on the media button on the breakout room you have been assigned to. Then you click open and the link will take you directly to the breakout room. To close the breakout room, click close on the right hand side of the screen. And with this, I wish you a great workshop. Thank you, Jean-Luc. Um, Thank you very much, Heather. We now, we now have a coffee break. And uh, as, as I echo John Lou's point, thank you very much to everyone who has presented already today. And uh, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning after the breakout session for the plenary. Thank you. <laughs>